Mr. President, First Lady, Mr. President Karas, Prime Ministers, Ministers, Excellences, Ambassadors, Friends. You see here faces of heroes who died. They will be with us during all our conference. So we will know all the time that our talk must be completely honest. Some in the team said, let's hold minutes of silence for the heroes who died. But I think at our conference, they don't need silence. They need that we talk very loudly to the world about Ukraine. So the world supports Ukraine. The world supports Ukraine more to defeat the terrorists. Because this is a question of life or death, literally. Don't forget for one second what ha happens on the front while we speak. Now, the situation is strange. The majority of the leader in the West understand that if Ukraine loses, it, it's bad and dangerous for, for all. But there is a huge gap between intellectual understanding and actions. For the avoidance of downs, let me say clearly, without Western support, Ukrainians would have no chance to fight as we do, and we are very grateful for that. But still, it's much less than needed. The main task we board of years put ourselves for this conference is to brainstorm how to close this gap. Western leaders explain in different ways why they give Ukraine less than is needed. For example, they speak of the will of waters or they say that they need weapons also for their countries and other threats on the globe and very often they speak of the risk of escalation. I disagree with all of that. And now I will say only something about escalation argument because it's very powerful in the heads of some Western leaders. I want to show you the way how to look at this in the thinking of an engineer. And maybe this different angle helps make something clearer. Let's look in the different logics of, of how to support Ukraine in the diagram. Here is the x-axis, level of support. And here is the y-axis, probability of winning. I want to say that this diagram and all Others, they are qualitative, not quantitative, and they show a logic. And on this diagram, logic is very clear. The more military support for Ukraine, the higher chance that Ukraine wins. But when I hear statements of some Western leaders, I believe that very often they think of another y-axis, the risk of escalation. The more military support for Ukraine, the higher risk of escalation and NATO-Russia war. And this exchange of y-axis is a great success of Russian propaganda and manipulation and information war. Yeah. Western leaders think about escalation and they, they do less than what would allow Ukraine to win. And what's additionally devastating, they put limitation on how to use this weapon. This is self-deterrence. And they don't do just a little bit less. Now I will explain you what I mean. At our Ukrainian breakfast during World Economic Davos in January this year, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, Landberges, yeah, he is here, I'm happy, Minister, you are here made good comparison. 
He said, Poland, after Russian invasion into Ukraine, ordered 1,000 tanks, almost 500 HIMARS models, 80 jet fighters, etc., etc. Poland has a size similar to Ukraine, and even in the NATO and with Article 5. So what Poland has ordered is more or less 100% of what Ukraine is needed. But Ukraine got only 10% of the tanks, approximately 10% of HIMARS models, zero planes. So I would say 90% discount. Since January, Ukraine got much more, thanks God, but still, of 128 jet fighters, President Zelensky said we need, we got only 10. Of 25 Patriot system, according to official information, only four, plus few RST systems. I hope, but in reality, we have a little bit more, but, but still, on the third year of this war, even if we will calculate very generously, Ukraine has no more than 30-35% of what is needed. It means discount 65-70%. In September 2024, with this devastating limitation on how to use this weapon. And this Western logic of self-deterrence, discount of course, dramatically reduces chances for Ukrainian victory and increases chances that Ukraine lose. And this is wrong at least in two ways. First, in Europe. Some people in Europe already understand if Ukraine will lose, the enemy will not stop. But some people still think that if Ukraine lose, it's, it will be very bad, but then the enemy will stop and Ukraine can be liberated later and for those let us make a thought experiment the european union and nato will have on their board ukraine occupied by russia many millions of migrants will come into europe and do you remember bucha it will be mass shooting like bucha all over ukraine it will be contemporary Holocaust. And do you really think that the European Union will be able to survive if it lets this happen? Do you really believe that the West can coexist peacefully with such a neighbor? And second reason is a global domino of wars and crises. If Russia will be successful in Ukraine, China, North Korea, and Iran are more likely to do something against uh, Taiwan, South Korea, and Israel. All the world will be drawn into the war. So, even if to use the escalation Y axis, it, it should be other way around. The more military support for Ukraine, the lower risk of escalation and NATO-Russia war and the global domino of wars against democracy. And what is very important on this diagram, here is the level of support, of level of risk, how some Western leaders thesis see this with this very relatively low level of support. But here is the le level of risk where we are really with such a level of support. And there is huge underestimation of risk in the midterm. And this is very dangerous. I hope, I hope we should, we could help Western leaders to change their logic from self-deterrence to resolve. This is the only logic and language which our enemy will understand. Now, one more fundamental point. I thought a lot about 
Why it's only Ukrainians who fight in this war and give their lives? Why do Westerners think they have a luxury to say, we don't want to be in this war? As Timothy Snyder said, it's a strange world war when only one nation fights. Why only one nation? I am reminded of one very bitter joke which members of the Jewish intelligentsia liked to tell in the 1970s. They said to their friends, let me tell you a joke. One day, announcement is made. Tomorrow at 8 a.m., at train station, at track five, must assemble all Jews and all cyclists. And here was a trap, and at this moment, each single person listening walked in this trap and asked, but why the cyclist? And this moment, members of Jewish intelligence with triumphant smile ask back, but why the Jews? And during this war, when I hear statements of some leaders, I remember this joke and I see bef before my eyes. In Brussels, for example in Brussels, announcement is made to defend freedom and European values tomorrow at 8 a.m. at trade station at track five, must assemble all Ukrainians and all European Union citizens. And I am afraid the reaction will be, but why the Europeans? As a result of my thinking why it's only one Ukrainian nation fight in this war, I came to the conclusion, and I mean this literally. I sincerely believe that time and history have chosen Ukrainians in this 21st century. Ukrainians are the chosen people, chosen to show the West and the world how to fight to protect freedom and values. And in this war, And in this war, the undisputed leader of the great Ukrainian chosen people in their fight for freedom is you, Mr. President. And one more point. When I call Ukrainian the chosen people, many important parallels appear in the mind. I give just one, the pharaoh must lose. But for this that Pharaoh loses, we must defeat him. And we must defeat him not only for survival of the chosen people and victory of chosen people. Western leaders are wrong if sometimes they say Ukrainians fight for independence and we just help them. This word help or aid sounds nice, but represents wrong mindset, and mindset of leaders matters. Because yes, of course, Ukrainians fight for independence, but also for the survival of the international order and the principles which West finds crucial. The West must see this as a partnership with Ukrainians. In this partnership, West doesn't give lives. Okay, only Ukrainians give lives, but then at least give weapons as much as necessary and as quick as you physically can and without any restrictions and limitations. And of course, see Ukrainian lives as equally valuable as Western lives. So, our 
conference, our 20th Yalta European Strategy Conference is only one small drop, but maybe not one drop in the ocean, but one of those drops whose constant dripping wears away the stone. And our drop must get through the stone and bring the feeling of the necessity to win. And in the very end, I want to say this even simpler and more categorical, and maybe this line will help understand better what we really face. To win or not to be. This is not a question. Yes, this is not a question. This is terrible, brutal dilemma for Ukraine, for Europe, for all civilized world. It has to be under the skin of all leaders. To win or not to be. Thank you for your attention. I wish you a very productive conference. Uh, our panel will moderate our great friend Farid Zakaria from CNN. And now is my greatest honor to invite on this stage our commander in chief and the leader of great Ukrainian chosen people, President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. Thank you so much. I will speak Ukrainian language, so please use this if somebody doesn't know our language. Or forget, <laughs> because we have long history. Um, Slava Ukraini. Glory be to Ukraine. Glory be to heroes, uh, esteemed participants, uh, of the conference this year conference yalta european strategy number 20. dear friends of ukraine uh, victor thank you for the invitation and i'm glad to greet you all in ukraine right now and many uh, not for the first time and this is very important at the time of such a war to be in ukraine to be next to our, our defenders, uh, defenders of Ukraine, all our people, the people who have to get through the direst straits uh, imaginable, the full-scale war. And I'm very grateful to you for being with Ukraine, but it is very important also for us to realize what it means to be with Ukraine. It's not about presence. It's not just about emotional relationship with our state, with Ukrainians, our battle for independence. Yesterday, the Ukrainian, uh, the Russian troops um, uh, ma uh, made another strike against Ukraine that was uh, with artillery. Birolubuka village in the Netsk region suffered the strike. Uh, they saw where they were aiming uh, the Red Cross uh, trucks. Uh, Two people are wounded because of this strike, three dead. My condolences. Those were humanitarian workers belonging to a humanitarian mission. Their lives are taken by the Russian artillery. It is very sad that the Red Cross in their official communication was afraid to even mention that was a Russian strike. That's life. But that's their face, our lives, their faces. 
and uh, their image. This is a Russian uh, strike, Russian terror. Yesterday, the Russian troops uh, off offered another strike. The Russian missile hit a civilian vessel in the Black Sea. I think that was not far from the Romanian coast. Uh, that was a Balkar with rain, the destination port in Egypt. And we mm, were just lucky not to lose any of the crew with that missile, and Egypt uh, offered no reaction, none whatsoever, though that was their food security. And that's how Russia treats Egypt, food security and free navigation. As a typical terrorist, uh, when we have double uh, standards still in uh, morality, Putin can always find some alternative to peace. Now, the third year of this terrible war, Full scale, as it is, after all the killings, after all the uh, ruin in Ukraine, after all those uh, crimes and terrorist attacks, Putin can still enjoy the opportunity to kill Ukrainians and take lives of Ukrainians as much as he wants, uh, buy artillery, munition, uh, missiles, rockets, and claim to the world even the, um, some ultimatums. Expecting the world to actually yield to his craze. The third year of the war, and he still believes that uh, he uh, uh, is um, entitled to have uh, concessions. Why? Uh, one of these days we had uh, very important um, guests uh, from the United States, very important visits uh, from the US and UK in particular. And we cannot uh, actually reveal all the contents of the close part of the uh, talks uh, between us and the partners, but let me share my feeling. Now in in Ukraine, um, like many countries in the world, we are beginning the school year. Our children went to school and we want uh, as many children as possible to st uh, stay offline, not to study online, but mingle with the other children um, in uh, the environment, learning environment, not just learning, but also social environment. Um, that's life. And uh, for this we need um, air defense, patriots, first of all. We have enough in the world, and we expect from our partners that Exactly, but it, uh, we have open and close meetings with the partners, but we uh, repeat that we need air defense. It's very difficult to hear. Um, we are working on this for an answer. And uh, the Russian missiles and shahids provided by Iran are still at work, but they are at work in our air against our people. And Putin needs no permits, no permission, no understanding for the long range. You heard many of you, you have seen and uh, made sure how difficult it was um, um, at the front line, especially at Pokrovsk, uh, the Donetsk region, and our heroic warriors, soldiers. I would like us to um, give them a round of applause, a big hand indeed, what they do. And indeed, the strong uh, men and women, and uh, we all understand that they need uh, some reinforcement. And that means that we need uh, trained, men, supplied, well supplied brigades. It's uh, just to retain the positions and uh, renew some positions. And we've been talking uh, for months for the for the um, arrangements and the fourth generation for those brigades. I'm very thankful to all the jurisdictions which accepted the responsibility and to do that in a timely fashion. But quite frankly, we are far away from full compliance with the original 
arrangements, and the arrangement happened a long time ago. When we remind people, our interlocutors, at our talks uh, of that, it's very difficult to hear in response. We're working on it. Uh, mean, meanwhile, Putin is burning our villages, our cities. He does not need any um, arrangements, understanding, and there is no delay in his decisions, and he treats um, our delays as a permission to do anything he wants, anything he would like to do to us. And for the long range um, arguments, uh, you should look it up uh, on the map, where the strikes from Russia actually come from, where they generate their force, and where they keep their reserves, and where they deploy their troops and have their military facilities, and what kind of logistics they use. If you see that, everyone who can see that, obviously, understands why Ukraine needs long-range systems. And we discussed that in much detail with Tony Blinken and David Lammy, and, uh, Secretary of State and uh, Foreign Secretary from their respective countries. They recently visited Kyiv, and uh, after our conversation, I'm sure nobody can any uh, have any doubts uh, of Ukraine really needing the long range. And let me emphasize again, enough not just to say that the decision is taken, that the long range, in long enough to change this war to act as a game changer and make uh, Russians seek peace. And we rely upon our partners very much. We hope for the result from our partners. At least we are working on this. Dear ladies and gentlemen, when we think how to conclude this war, we uh, have to understand clearly that this is needed uh, to us, uh, not Putin. Putin does not want to uh, close uh, anything, to end anything. Uh, he is comfortable sending people to, out to die and uh, stay in his bubble watching uh, the spectacle. His uh, war does not really concern, still not, not yet. Uh, the uh, cronies of his and himself, but they will, should uh, feel the effect of this war. That means that the war should uh, become much harder on Russia. And that's the only way, that's the only way to make Russia understand that this war should end, and in a fair way, based on the international law. And for this, we need strong decisions of the world, and every one of you knows which decisions exactly. And when we hear that we have new missiles in Russia arriving from Iran, the same kind of evil, and uh, well, um, in the Middle East, uh, the partners uh, had that um, experience uh, previously. Uh, the model of the missile may be different, but the approach for proliferation of such weapons is the same. Uh, we have to down missiles and drones in the Middle East uh, sky. Why uh, cannot we have uh, a similar uh, solution for a decision? for Russian missiles and the Iranian shaheds in the sky of Ukraine. And this does not happen even when the missiles and drones um, um, uh, uh, target the um, neighboring countries directly. When we raise the issue with our partners um, on a regular, in a regular fashion, on a regular basis, but uh, they try to talk it out uh, instead, and uh, even omitting the uh, magic statements, uh, we're working on it sometimes. Afraid of those very words, and Belarus um, was the only um, brave country to down the Russian shaheds once.
I did not think that that was that would be the occasion. Uh, I think it's humiliating, humiliating uh, for uh, the strong democratic world. All belong to uh, both us and our partners. We know all the points where they concentrate their force for the strikes. All of them. Uh, the deployment of the Russian uh, air defense uh, systems, uh, and we can share this information with the partners if they do not know yet. And where the launch pads Russians come on, what are the logistical rules that are of critical importance for the occupation troops? Everything of it can be destroyed in just under months. Meanwhile, the war is going on, has been going for a decade, the full-scale one, almost for three years. So what is needed to put an end to it? It requires force, decisions, or maybe one's will, while Putin can keep the maximum level of its armament production. We saw it in the missiles hitting our cities every day, having components from around the world, from the Americas, from Taiwan, elsewhere. There still exist logistical routes, and actually it's easier for him to do terror than for us to defend against it. Unfortunately, the launching sites on the Russian territory are beyond reach of our defenders. We do have efficient drones, but you cannot do everything that you need with drones rather than missiles. Even speaking of artillery pieces, Putin can muster quite a lot of them uh, at rather cheap price from the North Korea. Meanwhile, for Ukraine, each defense package is uh, no small feat in itself. Why well, I'm talking about that for that long and that much. Sorry, sorry, going into so much detail about armaments, because actually it's about forcing Russia to peace. If Putin cannot understand anything else, and only something that makes it worse for Russia, and with partners doing necessary steps rather than promising to work on it, meeting after meeting. We need to work, and they still are discussing necessary steps, like there is still someone not quite clear about what these steps should be. And actually this month a meeting, my meeting with Biden has been planned, I will present our victory plan as a system of interlinked solutions and decisions to drive this war towards the peace course. That way the, the war Russia against Ukraine can end in several ways, either through forced, ex forcefully expelling them from our territory or through diplomacy. What is necessary is to get rid of this occupation in whichever option Ukraine needs to be in a strong position and the United States can help with it. If we with our key partner are willing to be victorious, to prevail, this package of assistance that I'm going to propose to the President will help paving the way towards Peace. Meanwhile, there are still some illusions elsewhere that it's still possible to negotiate something with Moscow, some red lines are still chartable, uh, there are still chances of making Moscow more inclined towards, you know, certain peace negotiations. We want to hear the words about the peace, just peace coming out of the land of Ukraine. But for that we need to make sure that Ukraine has become sufficiently strong to prevail. This will make a guarantee of peace. And this depends not just from us, but in many respects from the world, from you, from you, my friends. I thank all the Ukrainians for their valor, 
I thank every partner doing everything to make Ukraine strong, to make it prevail. I thank the world leaders for the key thing of assistance, the assistance that will make our victory certain. Hopefully, that way, it will penetrate the Putin's bubble and make it search for peace. Thank you, and glory to Ukraine. Uh, and finally, I do want to note, uh, as, uh, as uh, Victor and the President did, that this is the 20th uh, YES conference, and it is notable that uh, this conference has been going on for that long, uh, and that Victor Pinchuk has, and, and the team at YES, have maintained this idea of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's destiny as being part of the West for that long. Uh, it began in Yalta, of course. It continues in Kyiv, um, but that the goal remains unchanged. Um, Mr. President, I notice you're using your um, translation. That means we're going to do this in Ukrainian. Okay, so let me uh, let me begin by asking you: How do you see the battlefield right now? Because there, we hear many reports. We hear reports about a Russian counteroffensive in Kursk. We hear reports about things being difficult in Pokrovsk. I want to get your sense of when you look at it as commander in chief, what, give us a kind of a report from the battlefield. Thank you so much, uh, Farid. Uh, um, Uh, probably I'm not going to disclose all, all of the details. There are times I would really love to do it. Um, the situation on the battlefield is challenging indeed, but still, I think uh, the past week saw certain leveling out of the situation in the Donetsk region, particularly at Pokrovsk, because there are different directions, there are different challenges there. Things go parallel in Ukraine and uh, uh, parts of our operation, our offensive in the Kursk region. These things are linked. And we can see that the use of artillery shells in nearby Pokrovsk before the start of the Kursk operation was 1 to 12. Uh, asking them, yes, it was a matter of uh, getting the assistance package, but now this ratio is 1 to 2.5. Yes, it's not uh, getting equal. In this situation, we need even more than Russians need. If you want to stop them, if we want to regain, yet still, 1 to 12 was much more challenging than 1 to, to 2.5. And I consider this a success, uh, in part a success of this Kursk operation. As regards Kursk Oblast and what is going on there, yes, Russians kicked off the rapid counter of offensive uh, activity. Uh, they intend to use about 60, maybe 70,000 of the manpower. So they say we see closer to 30, 40,000 of them. They want to go on with deoccupation, as they put it. Nice, nice to hear not just us, but also them speaking about deoccupation. And yeah, they are attempting that. We don't see any serious success so far. Our valiant servicemen stand strong and do everything to prepare everything for our upcoming political steps. But generally, well, armament supplies, they do affect a lot the resilience of our brigades. This is for a fact. 
You know, we have, we've been talking a lot about training reserves, and people need to understand that. Yes, we are thankful to our partners, but when we speak about preparing reserves for the brigades, brigades we already have, it, it doesn't mean that we are not getting any assistance packages. Uh, we do have them. The problem is this is being done at a pace, very at a leisurely pace. But when you are fighting, you have losses, daily losses. And if you lose equipment and you run into a deficit and then you get a package which is not complete, what you are bound to do, you can either go for reserve or you can send them to the front line. And surely you think primarily about those who are actively fighting. Because of that, we every time we say, yes, we, thank, we are thankful to our partners, but we need full assistance packages as we had pre-agreed them upon. That way we would be able to defend our country, preparing our operations and fill out those brigades with trainers and reserves. We, this is not new ones. We have them. We have been having them for quite some time. So let me ask you what some people worry about. And uh, I, I, I think you understand as the leader of a democracy it makes sense for you to, to answer and respond to these concerns. There are people who say maybe the attack on, on, in the Kursk region was a mistake, that you took 15, 20,000 of Ukraine's best soldiers, you diverted them there, the Donbass, the front line was left uh, more weak, the Russians are now making advantage, uh, advances in Pokorsk. What do you say to people about that possibility? Well, the speed in Donetsk direction was even faster before the start of the Kursk operation, and not just there, in the east in general, just to remind you, they were moving in Kharkiv direction, and this is also a very important part of the center of the eastern Ukraine, and you know that they broke through our defenses. They wanted to get Kharkiv. Um, uh, that was besides the like, messages to make a, a kind of a buffer zone. And then we got an information from our partners. It wasn't our you know, whim or our uh, invention. You know, we have intelligence cooperating. So there was an information that uh, on the north of our country, close to Sumy, Oblast. Uh, it was. It had been too early to uh, speak about it. We need. We had to verify information. But there were some plans of them to create buffer zones along the northern border of our country. And with those successes they had, they intended to capture centers of such regions. In the, that was why Kursk operation was launched and. I think it did bring results that we effectively counted on. <coughs> we stopped the enemy in Kharkiv Oblast. It's very it's a very challenging situation in Donetsk Oblast, but we slowed them practically to a halt. In many directions, we see them get the uh, forces uh, also in the southern part uh, near Zaporizhia. They had to take some of the troops that they had prepared to occupy our territories, and that was then being moved to Kursk direction. So just to be clear so we understand, uh, you are saying that you, rec you received reports presumably from U.S. intelligence that the Russians were going to attack and that in a sense the Kursk operation was a preemptive a, a Ukrainian strike before the Russians could attack. Well, not just uh, intelligence. I think we all saw what they did in Kharkiv Oblast. It was already too late to talk to intelligence people. We were getting information from the Kharkiv region as well. But let us go through that moment. We've lived it through already. Yes, as regards the northern parts, yes, we were getting information about them intending to have a buffer zone in some region. You've, you've talked often about munitions. Can you give us a sense uh, as to what 
are the critical needs that Ukraine has? Because you now have a sense, you have received things, the HIMARS, the attack AMs. What is working best? What do you need more of? What, you know, what in retrospect was not as important? Is there, what are the most urgent needs? What is the most effective thing uh, in terms of munitions that is, uh, that is being, being useful to counter the Russians? I don't think uh, that changed a lot in this war. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to overcome uh, the deficit, the deficit of things that we, uh, well, we depend on imports, like artillery, shells, 155 millimeters. Uh, we didn't have a lot of them at the beginning of it, still not enough here, and you can see that aggregate, the an aggregate production in, across all Europe cannot cope with the scape, scope of this uh, land war. So 155 caliber. Now we also see certain complexities with drone supply, FPV drones. In parallel, it, these drones were quite a bit of assistance parallel to artillery pieces. Uh, now we, we we have certain interest in 152 caliber, 152, but I'm not sure that everyone is interested in that. Now. Coming to anti-aerial defenses, yeah, you mentioned like four Patriot systems. I, I would not give the number, but I would rather say that not enough of them. Surely not enough of them. Thanks God, realities are a bit more positive than the official information. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks God uh, to, and thanks to our teams and our partners, Patriots, Nassams, IRST, other such systems like Hawks, they all have been working and better they continue using missiles and we are short of such missiles. Just to give you an example, how our anti-aerial guys are operating. They are good guys, they are strong professionals. But you know, when normally you would spend two missiles per target, they are in the purely Ukrainian manner, say, okay, let us use just one. Hopefully, it will be enough. A kind of a joke, but, you know, a tragedy as well, because they're quite short of those missiles, and attention should be focused on that. The Russians have been using the military planes and uh, guided gliding bombs pounding our east. Uh, why do we need attack arms missiles? And in their current format, with current uh, permits, they stand for nothing, because we cannot use them against their launch sites, against our other airfields with planes and helicopters that they use to attack us. They, we are severely limited with attack arms. Well, because of the numbers also, but primarily with the range, and this is a fact. High Mars, they've been very, very helpful to us. I'd like to thank the US for this uh, machinery. I would not give exact. Uh, you know, numbers, but let me give you some figures and some percentage. At the beginning of it, uh, the supplies of Hamas were three times as high than that we have now. So normally, going deeper into the war, you should have been receiving more of it. We cannot definitely exert any pressure on the US. We are deeply thankful to them for that. But again, speaking of Hamas, Attack them, other such means, capable to take down, to eliminate the enemy. We need not to limit their supplies, but on the contrary, increase their production. Furthermore, there are countries and some, uh, some equipment, the production of which is been growing. Not going to give you names to avoid any provocations of Russia, from Russia against them. But yeah, the potential in some countries also in the US is growing, and we are thankful for this. But again, this is not yet enough to properly equip all our servicemen, which I mentioned. 
35, by the way. Yeah, I can give you this number. 35. Man pads. We've been using different types of man pads systems on the battlefield. 35% of all the shahids with them. This is our analytics available. This is a very precise one because we have a digital platform for that. So all of shahids, all of drones Russia has been using against us, our oil sector, our civilians and the infrastructure. I mean, hitting us in our infrastructure. So we use man pads to take down 35% of them. And these, uh, this weapon is in huge deficit. We are also mentioning some uh, corridors Russia has been using. They try changing them, but we don't understand the main aerial corridors they use to attack our country. We don't understand that, but we don't have that enough. Too long. <laughs> You, you mentioned that... You had to give me this. <laughs> you mentioned that there, there, are, there are some political steps that you were going to outline to President Biden. Now, I'm not going to ask you to outline them to us before you outline them to President Biden, but can you give us a sense of what those will look like? Because as far as I can tell, Putin has said, yes, I'm happy to negotiate, but on the terms of the proposals he made in Istanbul, which are basically... He keeps all the territory. Ukraine has to uh, demilitarize. I assume those are not uh, uh, acceptable. So, is there some middle ground here that we that, that we should be looking at? I'm not sure that I can share for it with you all the details. Otherwise, you will understand everything <laughs> because you are a smart guy, and you will be the first man. Yes, maybe you will feel like the president of the United States. So I'm so sorry, I can't do it because I, I gave my word to President Biden. But of course, it's a, it's strategic plan. And when you when you said, as I understood, if I understood rightly, you because I heard translation. So, what can be in the middle? Uh, so this plan, which I will share to President Biden. This is in the middle before the peace summit. This plan will strengthen Ukraine, our soldiers and civilians, Ukraine, our country, and it's very important things. Not too much point. What, what is also good, I think, not because it's my idea, and, but, I, but I think what is good that there are not too much points. And all the points depends on decision of Biden. Not Putin. Not because Putin. <laughs> you see, not only you smart. <laughs> that's why I, I think, I, that's why I, I really think that it can help, it can help. I can't give 100% that it will stop Putin, no. But it will make Ukraine stronger more stronger, and I think push Putin to think about how to finish the war. I think so. I think so. But anyway, it will strengthen Ukraine and Ukrainian people, all of us. And it's very important. It's a very honest plan, very understandable package. It's more than we have. Yes, it's true, but it's enough to be strong. Tell I'm me, not sure that you understood everything. I, I, if I understood, but it was my plan. If I, if I understood you completely, then, it, then you made a mistake, right? You're trying to not let me understand it completely because you want Biden to be the first person to understand it. Um, let me ask you finally, uh, this has been three years now. Uh, this has been much, much more intense, I imagine, than you thought when you became president of Ukraine. Um, how, how has it changed you as a leader? How are you different today than you were when you started, when you, when you took the oath of office? Um, so, 
first of all, some steps back about President Biden. I'm sure that he will understand, and I will share it with Kamala Harris, Vice President, and if and also we are ready to share it with Donald Trump. So uh, we have, I think, we have to do it with both candidates, and then. I think that we can share it with all the, well, also with countries of the United States, because some of steps depends on their decision, and I think it's important, and it will be very influential for positive decision of this plan. Do you do you plan to meet yes, Donald Trump I plan. when you're in uh, New York? But for me, it doesn't matter what way to to speak with Trump. I have connection by phone, but I think that there are some things which we can't speak with details by phone. I'm, I'm not sure, but I, but I think it's, it's a little bit dangerous. Yes, but, but really, I'm, I'm not between us. I just, I just gave the word to President Biden that he the first, because mostly it depends on him. And, but I think it's better people to understand what, what, we, what, we, what we need and what we shared with the president and Kamala Harris and Donald Trump and with the Congress. So after all these consultations, I think we will share it also with the people. That's why I think Biden will understand. Yeah. Um, Maybe something changed. I don't know. It is second to your question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> have, have, have you changed as a, as a leader? I don't know, tell me. <laughs> I can only watch from the outside. Yes, I'm older. <laughs> you are? Yes, and you are too. <laughs> well, I remember, I remember the first time you were president and you came to Yes at the dinner, your, your old comedy guys came and did a skit. Yeah, that, that, that's a different world now. You are, it's, you are a wartime leader. It's a much more serious, you know... A lot of challenges. I think the world changed to be very serious and very honest. The world changed everybody. Everybody, all the families, all the Ukrainians. Yes, and I'm, I'm hope that this war, which is exactly in Ukraine, with thousands of losses, exactly losses of Ukrainian people, I really hope and I really count the, that this war also changed Europe and changed the world and their attitude to Ukraine, to our people, and their, sorry, commercial attitude to Russia and to Putin. I count on it very much. Otherwise, if it's not true, otherwise, he, you, you see, he, he, yeah. that, that what he wanted. Otherwise, that what he wanted. And I, otherwise, the, the world will lose to one person. It will be the historical, the, one of the biggest tragedy in history. But I, but I count that, really count on partners that all they understand. And I hope, as you said, Biden will understand everything. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.